Hi students, this is AJ sir. Let's study 10th standard ICAC Biology Chapter 14, Human Evolution. The theory of evolution is one of the fundamental pillars of scientific knowledge of today. When it was proposed a few centuries ago, it had revolutionized the world. You see, this theory is based on evidence. And there is sufficient evidence that we can call this theory as a proved theory. It explains how life developed on earth. According to this, billions of years ago, there was no life on earth, but there was autogenesis, that is, life was accidentally created through various chemical reactions and then from simple creatures complicated creatures were created like men and even more complicated like women which is at the peak of evolution the most intelligent species on earth so evolution is defined as a slow and continuous process where complex forms of life have emerged from simpler through millions of years. Now, in my introductory science lecture, I've already explained this process. We know that over millions of years, our ape-like ancestors gave rise to Homo sapiens, that is human beings. We shouldn't say that we have evolved from monkeys. Rather, monkeys and human beings have a common ancestor. So in this chapter, we will study about those ancestors. But before that, let's study and compare two theories of inheritance. One is a theory of natural selection or Darwinism. And the other is Lamarck's theory of inheritance of acquired characters. The most popular is Darwin's theory. For me, he's a hero because he gave a theory which came into direct conflict with various religious views at that time. His theory has five major points. Number one, organisms reproduce at a faster rate, that is, there is overproduction resulting in a fierce competition for food and space similar to what is happening with human beings with the population explosion now because of this competition there is a struggle for existence because the resources are very limited so species and individuals fight for survival and only the fittest will survive for example out of the entire human population only those people who are fit enough healthy enough whose immunity is strong enough, who can adapt to the changing environment, will live. And the weaker ones, the older ones, unfortunately, will perish. That is true for any species. For example, when we have a herd of deer passing through a grassland, and when a predator like a tiger attacks them, the older ones or the weaker ones are easily caught and killed whereas the healthy ones are able to escape this is called thinning the herd and this helps in natural selection because whichever individuals have qualities which make them strong enough for that environment will survive and they will pass on these characteristics to the next generation because all these characteristics depend on their dna which can be inherited by the future generations and whenever reproduction takes place the children are almost exactly similar to the parents but there are a few variations even siblings are different from each other that's because of the mixing up of the genetic material during 
meiosis and fertilization about which we will study in that respective chapter but the bottom line is that there is a lot of variation between individuals even in the same species look at human beings we are so different africans are totally different from asians who are who are totally different from europeans although almost 99% of our dna is same but still there are variations which are easily visible through the height the physique the skin color and even our internal processes like some of us have a great lung capacity like the people living near mount everest they naturally have a greater lung capacity people living near the equator naturally are able to survive in extremely hot climate because each of us is adapted to our environment and each of us is fit enough and that is why we are surviving so there is a process called natural selection for example uh, millions of years ago among the ape like ancestors the ones which accidentally developed a bigger brain were ha at an advantage they could survive better and reproduce more so the characteristic of bigger brain was passed on to the next generation so slowly new species were developed by small accumulation of such changes bigger brain erect posture less hair and we will study the, this transition shortly but over time these small changes lead to speciation that is a new species is created let's take a couple of examples to understand this first of all what do you mean by natural selection now here we see industrial melanism centuries ago in the manchester area of uk there were two kinds of moths the light colored one and the dark colored one initially the light colored ones were easily camouflaged or blended with the surroundings due to which they were not easily visible and they escaped the predator birds whereas the dark moths were easily visible against the background and they were eaten by the predator birds over time the population of the black moths or the dark moths was decreasing they could have become extinct as well but after the industrial revolution the pollution the carbon soot being deposited on the barks of the tree made the background darker the lichens which were growing there on the trees they died the lichens were making the background lighter so now the tables had turned now the dark moths were camouflaged whereas the lighter moths could be easily seen and they were being eaten up by the predatory birds so this is an example of natural selection the one which had a better characteristic suited to the environment survives and its population increases now let's understand speciation if you look at the various stages of evolution of man we see that over millions of years tiny changes happened gradually which led to huge changes in a long period of time so each of them represents a different species you see two species are different because they cannot easily reproduce with each other and australopithecus cannot reproduce with a cro-magnon man that is why they belong to different species and a new species is not created instantly it happens gradually so 
standing erect freed up their forearms bigger brain made them more intelligent so they were able to escape the predators they could make tools they could make fire they could survive better and reproduce more so these changes were advantages so they were carried forward to their children and their children's children and so on and today the modern man is at the peak of evolution a million years from now how will we look is anybody's guess predicting is very difficult maybe we'll have gills to survive the floods caused by global warming but understand that evolution is not intentional it's accidental nature doesn't design the species just variations just randomly happen in many of the children and if that variation is uh, useless or harmful he or she will die end of story but if that variation is useful it will continue so this was the darwin's theory and he had given a lot of evidence for it now let's compare it with lamarck's theory of inheritance which is not so popular it has two points first of all use and disuse it says that if you keep using a particular part a lot that will develop it will become stronger or longer for example he predicts that millions of years ago giraffes did not have a long neck in fact there was no species called giraffe perhaps there was a horse like ancestor and some of them stretched try to stretch their necks a lot because there was a competition for food and the food available at lower heights was getting over so the ones which were able to lengthen their necks would get the vegetation and would survive and they would pass on this characteristic to their children which is uh, quite suspect that such a thing can happen and the second point that they talked about was the presence of vestigial organs that is whichever organ is not used become smaller and smaller and may may even perish after some time now this is well supported for example we have wisdom teeth the last moles all of us all adults have 28 teeth and many of us even have 32 teeth but those last four teeth in the end are hardly of any use in fact many people don't even grow them throughout their life and they call wisdom teeth because they grow after your teenage years are over and you get wisdom which is lacking in teenagers so i don't blame you for that it's the age another example is the vermiform appendix now the appendix is very useful in herbivores like cows etc who which helps in digestion of the plant food that they eat the grass etc but in human beings since we don't eat uh, cellulose food like grass we don't need the appendix anymore and so it's in the shriveled form and it is supposedly functionless in fact if it gets inflamed and infected we can even cut it out and throw it away through surgery so it's a vestigial organ however modern research says that appendix may after all have some function in our body because some bacteria grow in it which are good bacteria and this good bacteria may be useful in keeping a healthy gut next function which has become dysfunctional now is that of the pinna muscles there are muscles in the ears now it's understandable if a rabbit or a dog can have a moving pinna they have to move their pinna to that is a external ear they have to move it so that they can collect sound and they can uh, move accordingly but human beings have a very small pinna and this these muscles are dysfunctional so it's a vestigial organ why do we have it it's because its utility has reduced perhaps in the future it will disappear forever
So once again, the difference between Lamarck's theory and Darwin's theory. This is called the theory of inheritance of acquired characters. Whatever characters you acquire in your life, you can pass it to your children. So if you can lengthen your neck, maybe your children will be born with long necks, which is quite laughable. Darwin's theory, on the other hand, is a theory of natural selection, which is more scientific. Lamarck's theory believes in the use and disuse of an organ. The parts used or, or changes acquired get transmitted. Darwin's theory believes that since variations exist in individuals, only the fittest survive in the struggle for existence. Lamarck's theory states that new species evolve after a long period of time after many generations by acquiring new characters, which is reasonable. And Darwin's theory says that new species evolve due to accumulation of favorable variations over a long period of time. So here he says that characters are acquired by us in the process of living. But Darwin's theory says that variations are random. It's not in our control at all. It just happens. It may or may not be favorable. So if it's favorable, then it will continue for a long time. So Darwin's theory is uh, accepted far and wide. Now let's talk about the different species which gave birth step by step to Homo sapiens. So we'll talk about six of them. Australopithecus our ancestor, then Homo habilis, Homo erectus, as the name suggests it was erect, Neanderthal man, also called Homo neanderthalensis, Cro-Magnon man, also called Homo sapiens, we are directly related to Cro-Magnon man, and then the modern man, which is Homo sapiens sapiens, which is, uh, sapiens means intelligent, so sapiens sapiens means very intelligent, which is quite obvious when we see how uh, intelligent human beings are looking at the pollution we have caused and the destruction of natural resources that we do and the wars that we fight. Anyway, coming back to biology, let's compare on some characteristics. Bipedalism, um, almost bipedal, means two legs, they would walk on two legs. You see animals, they walk on all four, so that's called uh, quadrupeds, but we are bipedals. Homo habilis also had a bipedal gait, but slightly more erect than Australopithecus, as you can see in the picture. Homo erectus, fully erect, absolute bipedalism, perfect and perfect. So there's hardly any difference between Cro-Magnon man and Homo sapiens sapiens. It's actually the same. We just like to use a fancier term for ourselves, thinking that we are special on Earth compared to other species. By the way, the, all the other species are now extinct. We are the only species in the Homo genus. Also, the evolution was not linear. It's not like this gave uh, rise to this and vice versa. It's a bit more complicated, but we don't have to get into that. Now, cranial capacity means brain capacity. Australopithecus had a smaller brain. As you can see, the numbers are increasing and now we have a large brain. At least most of us have a large brain. Some of us might not yet have it. Or maybe we do, but we don't use it. Size of canine teeth. We have very small canines if you go to see. Because we are not carnivores, we are omnivores. Compared to say a tiger or a lion, our canines are quite small. We need to learn all, the, all these values and all of the information because differentiate between or short note can be asked in exam. Let's talk about the forehead and the brow ridges. The forehead, that is the uh, region of the head above the eyebrows. They had a low forehead and the eyebrow ridges projecting over the eyes. <coughs> So you can see in this diagram, the forehead is quite low, very small forehead, hardly any. Compared to our forehead, we have a, a large forehead. And the eye ridges, as you can see, it's quite prominent, it's above the eye. And our eye ridge is not that sharp. 
one more difference I see is the chin they hardly have any chin here but we have a chin a distinctly visible chin remember homo erectus um, had a prognathous face that is the, the jaws were forward and Cro-Magnon man has a orthognathous face that is a straight jaw about the chin we'll have already sp spoken about it even Australopithecus had prognathous face so the first three has prognathous and the last three has orthognathus but it's a transition body hair lot of hair less hair less hair less hair hardly any hair because now we don't need the hair so in the future say thousands of years from now evolution may, can make sure that we don't have any hair left on the body which will save a lot of money which we waste in uh, waxing etc height and posture well australopithecus was short heighted average height was 3.5 to 4 feet which has increased over time and now it is 5.5 uh, to 6 feet 